Uh, thank you, Daniel and Mike. Uh, good morning. And I'd like to thank Dan and Mike for inviting me to give this talk. I'm really the warm up for the other speakers who, I'm gonna tell you how to find the polyps and then once I tell you how to find them, they're gonna tell you how to resect them and how to follow people appropriately after that. So the, um, the objectives of this session are to review the recent uh, guideline recommendations for colorectal cancer screening and to discuss when to begin screening, how to screen, and what tests to do or suggest. And then to understand a little bit about how individual risk for colorectal cancer or advanced neoplasia can be estimated. So last year, the US Preventive Services Task Force and the Canadian Health Task Force redid their recommendations. The US Preventive Services Task Force gave screening people age 50 to 75 years old an A recommendation, meaning that there was substantial evidence of benefit. For those age 76 to 85, they gave that a grade C and said to individualize that decision because of a varying risk-benefit ratio. With regard to modality and interval, you can see from the slide that they recommended several different screening tests and strategies with no preference for any single strategy. So high sensitivity, guaiac-based fecal occult blood test or fecal immunochemical test, the new stool blood-based test, were recommended every year. A flex sig could be done alone every five years or every 10 years with an annual fecal immunochemical test. Colonoscopy, of course, was recommended every 10 years. A new test, the multi-target stool DNA test, was recommended every year or every three years. It's FDA approved for every three year use and CT colonography every five years. So a lot of latitude with the recommendations. In contrast, our Canadian colleagues who are arguably more disciplined than we are in the US and base their judgments more on evidence from randomized trials, not models, not observational studies, gave screening age 50 to 59. They said you could do it, but the recommendation was weak. It was strongest in those ages 60 to 74. They recommended not screening persons who were 75 years of age or older. And the two modalities they recommended were guaiac-based fecal occult blood testing or fecal immunochemical testing every two years instead of every year, again, consistent with most of the randomized trials, and a flexible sigmoidoscopy every 10 years, again, consistent with randomized trials. They specifically did not recommend screening with colonoscopy. Regarding when to start screening, for average risk, the starting age is 50. Under these conditions, no first degree relative with colorectal cancer, or only one first degree relative diagnosed after the age of 60. If you have a first degree relative diagnosed before age 60, that's considered high risk and on the next slide. Uh, as a corollary to that, the American College of Physicians and the American College of Gastroenterology uh, state that African Americans, we should start screening them between ages 40 and 45 years. The evidence supporting that recommendation is weak. What about high risk? For those with colorectal cancer and a first degree relative prior to age 60 or two or more first degree relatives, irrespective of age, the recommendations to screen with colonoscopy starting at age 40 or 10 years before the youngest case. In cases where there's a genetic or clinical diagnosis of a non-hereditary polyposis colorectal cancer syndrome or an increased risk for that, and that's Lynch syndrome and others, Colonoscopy is recommended every one to two years, beginning at, beginning at ages 20 to 25, or 10 years before the youngest case. And finally, for those very rare people with genetic diagnoses of FAP or suspected FAP, an annual flex sig beginning at age 10 to 12 years. So here's the menu of colorectal cancer screening tests. And you can see there's, there's a lot on the menu. But in actuality, there's really not a lot on the menu. In the US, the most popular tests by far are FIT testing and colonoscopy. Used much less frequently are the new multi-target stool DNA and CT colonography, the latter being done in pockets of the country where it's reimbursed. Old and rarely used is sigmoidoscopy and uh, double contrast barium enema. New and currently hardly ever used is the colon capsule recently approved by the FDA for screening. It's not yet diffused all that much. 
and a blood-based test for methylated septin-9. So which test for which patient? Well, if you're high risk by the criteria I mentioned previously, it's straightforward, it's colonoscopy. If you're average risk, 85 to 90% of the US population, not very helpful, not a lot of discrimination there, then it's either colonoscopy, FIT, or the multi-target stool DNA test that is reimbursable at this time. As Sid Winterwer says, he was the, the uh, chair of the US Multi-Society Task Force and headed up the National Polyp Study. The best test is the one that gets done and done well. As part of the documentation for the US Preventive Services Task Force, they had several cost-effectiveness analyses done. These are, these are simulation models that take a large population and put them through what each of these strategies was. And they, f they recommended these four as being more or less equivalent. So colonoscopy every 10 years, sigmoidoscopy every 10 years with an annual fit, colon a CT colonography every five years, and an annual fit test all provided, a there's a little bit of variation in the number of life years gained, but in terms of deaths avoided, they were more or less equivalent. And they used colonoscopies required as a surrogate for resource utilization. And obviously that's gonna be highest when you're doing colonoscopy on everyone. It was much less in those getting CT colonography or annual fit. This slide summarizes the evidence for uh, colonoscopy effectiveness. There are no randomized trials on this slide. These are all observational studies, but there's a good number of them from several different countries. These are all pretty rigorously done. They look at different endpoints, but they mostly look at mortality and incidence. And you can see overall, they show protective, uh, a protective effect of colonoscopy, more so in the left colon than the right colon, but more recent studies have begun to close the gap between the left and right colon effectiveness. So colonoscopy clearly is the most sensitive one-time test. It's considered, quote, one-stop shopping and that it's diagnostic and therapeutic in the same session. It affords the longest interval for rescreening, 10 years, and it's cost-effective by our standard economic metrics. However, it does involve a rigorous bowel prep, and patients will uniformly say that was the worst part. It requires sedation and logistics like bringing a driver, not being able to drive yourself for that day. Uh, it's operator and prep dependent, as we know, and despite relatively low risk, it is still high risk when we consider it uh, against other screening tests, and even though it's cost effective, it's still costly to screen the entire population with colonoscopy. This slide summarizes the randomized trials of screening sigmoidoscopy, and you can see these are four large randomized controlled trials done in four different countries, more or less the same age group with remarkably consistent results regarding mortality reduction and incidence reduction. There's more variation in incidence reduction because it takes longer to show that, and there's some variation in the time to follow up. But these results are very consistent. So the pros of sigmoidoscopy, we do have the highest quality evidence of any screening test for sigmoidoscopy, without doubt. It could be an office-based procedure if we could get back to doing it without sedation. Uh, it's considered very cost-effective. It's very low risk and low cost. That's part of the problem with it. Uh, the cons are that, again, it requires a bowel prep, though not as extensive as colonoscopy. It can be uncomfortable when used without sedation. It examines only the distal colon, more on this in a minute, and there are issues around reimbursement, training of persons to do it, and quality assurance. This is a recently studied uh, paper from The Lancet that combined the data from three out of four of those randomized trials and looked at different demographic subgroups. And uh, of note is that um, Flexig reduced the incidence and mortality in men very consistently without respect to age. Whereas in women, it didn't do it quite as well. The incidence uh, rate ratio is 0.83, the mortality ratio 0.82, so not as strong as in men. And when you look at women over the age of 60, there was no reduction in incidence or mortality, whereas there was a, an incidence and mortality reduction in those under 60 years. So should sigmoidoscopy be a real option? Well, by far, we have the best quality evidence for that modality, and it's very consistent. 
we know not everyone wants colonoscopy. We're around 65% of having the U.S. population screen. We are not going to achieve 80% by 2018. Giving people a choice could increase uptake. This is the primary modality used by several countries, and it's recommended in guidelines from the U.S., Canada, and Europe. So the uh, concept that doing sigmoidoscopy is like doing mammography on one breast, it sounds good, but it really isn't that clever. This slide looks at it quantitatively. The relative mortality reduction from flex sig in the left colon is 67 to 80%. It's 30% in the proximal colon. Doing mammography on both, both breasts reduces mortality by 30%. Further, if single breast mammography detected 67 to 80% of all breast cancer and doing mammography on the other breast required all the things on this slide, sedation, more difficult prep, additional time loss from work, a driver, and so on, we would be doing single breast mammography in this country. I want to turn now to prediction rules for colorectal cancer screening. We have several of these available and they can help us estimate future risk of colorectal cancer, current risk of advanced neoplasia, that's the combination of colon cancer and advanced precancerous polyps, and current risk of advanced proximal neoplasia. There are a few of those. Let's look first at future risk, but before we do that, let's consider what we use to estimate risk. And we use age, but we use it dichotomously. Even though a person's risk of colon cancer doubles every 10 years, between the ages of 50 and 80. And of course, we use family history. These two variables alone tell us when to screen and how to screen. Yet we know a lot about adverse factors. Older age, male sex, cigarette smoking, BMI, excessive alcohol ingestion, red meat in the diet, and of course, a family history. But there are also protective factors, a moderate to high level of physical activity, certain elements of the diet, a previous negative screening test, and the use of aspirin, NSAIDs, and um, estrogens. So if you are, get bored during the session, you can whip out your phone, get on this website. This is the, col the NCI's colorectal cancer risk assessment tool. This is the first screen you'll see. You click on risk calculator. You answer questions about all the variables that I had on that previous slide. And at the end of it, you get a summary screen that shows you your five-year, 10-year, and lifetime risk of colon cancer. Again, this is a future risk, uh, and it is in comparison with uh, other persons your age. This slide summarizes some of the prediction rules on current risk of advanced proximal neoplasia. This is important if we're doing sigmoidoscopy to know when do we have to do colonoscopy after that. And you can see that these rules use age, sex, distal findings, maybe one or two other variables. Uh, the problem with them is that their validation has been limited, and uh, some people will use that as an excuse, and that there's no impact analysis. In other words, how has this affected screening? Have these rules increased uptake? Have they helped patients make choices about what strategy to choose? Same is true for models predicting advanced neoplasia anywhere in the colon. There are several of these. I mentioned only four. There are at least 10. Uh, again, the same factors, age, sex, family history, smoking, NSAID use, uh, body mass index, waist circumference. Uh, many of these have been internally validated, but no impact analysis. The most common risk factors for colorectal cancer and advanced neoplasia are age, sex, family history, cigarette smoking, and then some physical measure, either BMI, waist circumference, or waist to hip ratio, we looked at five of these factors in a cohort undergoing their first time screening colonoscopy and could separate them into four groups. A very low risk group with a risk of advanced neoplasia of just under 2%. Average risk is around 7 to 8% in a, in a screened population. A low risk group just under 5%, these numbers are in yellow. Intermediate risk group under 10% and a high risk group that was around 25%. So if you were using this rule to help make, uh, to have patients make decisions, if they were in the high risk group, I'd say a risk of one in four 
to have an advanced neoplasm probably warrants doing colonoscopy, whereas the very low and low risk groups could uh, allow you to confidently recommend lesser invasive strategies. And if we took the, that very low and low risk group and looked at them closely, what would we have missed doing sigmoidoscopy? So in the derivation set, there were five cancers. Uh, the derivation set for the very low and low risk group represented just over half of all persons screened. All the five cancers were distal. And if the strategy of sigmoidoscopy for any distal polyp were used, three quarters of the advanced neoplasms would have been detected. In the validation set, there were no distal cancers, and nearly 90% of all the advanced neoplasms would have been detected. So in summary, when do you begin screening? At age 50, earlier for high-risk family history. How? Even though there is a menu, it comes down to colonoscopy every 10 years, fit annually, or the multi-target stool DNA test every three years. What tests for whom? If you're high risk, it's colonoscopy. If it's average risk, it's shared decision making using the menu. While the evidence is strongest for sigmoidoscopy, it's currently rarely used in the US because of reimbursement and training issues. And along with family history factors such as age, sex, cigarette smoking, and BMI or waist circumference may be used to guide provider recommendations. Thank you.